Well, thanks so much for coming over to our Monarch and Milkweed, Monarchs of the Gulf Coast. Um, I'm so excited to have Dr. Kaz Taylor here from Tulane. I was at a, um, a bird banding, an identification, and we were looking at the Monarchs and some girl said, we met this woman and she knows everything. <laughs> no, but, and then y'all were studying and um, so she's over from at Tulane. So I called and she called me right in the garden and we started talking and then I kept thinking, you know what, maybe she needs to come. We tried to work it out, but I'm super excited to have her. I, as a person who runs a community garden, um, Chris has been a, an amazing advocate for the butterfly. She's given us a way station. And you can see, Chris, what's happened. We're going through changes, but we're, we're still supporting with our willow, um, a lot of butterflies. And we still do have milkweed all over the place. But I really thank Chris a lot, because really, she showed up at the garden similar to my finding out about Dr. Kaz. And um, one day, I was getting ready to leave, and she shows up with seeds and information and a little thing with the butterflies in it. And so we've become good friends when we can both see each other. So if it really wasn't for you, you probably wouldn't be here for Chris. Yeah, well, that's the truth, really, right? It's a community, it's a community garden. So I'm Elizabeth Eubanks. I get to run the community garden for those of you that don't know me. How many people have never been here before? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, um, anyway, I thank you for coming. I'm here about anywhere between 20 and 40 hours, three to seven days a week, it just depends. I'm on social media, we post there. Um, we have five objectives, and those objectives, our community is one in five, because then we make a nice little circle with that. And then our second objective is education. I've taught for almost probably 30 years now, on and off, on, formal and informal. And I had two of my students here from Palm Beach County, one from fourth grade all the way to senior, they're Navy guys, and I can't even tell you what that means, to be an educator, really. And then our, um, our third goal, we actually do practice organic gardening. Um, we have volunteers here as well. Um, we practice that, and then we, um, we are really into visual performing arts. So we just have that. So we're kind of encompassing everything today. So thank you for coming. And um, in two little rules, we have the Hippocratic Oath, which the doctors take, first do no harm. And then we have make a positive impact, and we're kind of doing that right now just by being Please do me a nanosecond favor and just introduce yourself to somebody, like shake their hand, look at them in the eyes and say hello. We have several volunteers here while you're doing that, I'm just going to talk to. Um, we have Sarah over here who's been out there volunteering and Sarah's over at Everman's if you want to see her. Um, we also have my husband who has been um, our aesthetics director and really, really helpful. Started out here several years ago, um, and she had started 850 Eco. Katie is the monarch in the milkweed. So, lots of volunteers. We've started a new youth program called Arise and Grow Now. And Max has been volunteering for quite a while. I've known Canaan's for a while on different things, and then we have Max. So, they're part of our new program, really, and they're going to help me develop that. So, anyway, I welcome you. I welcome Dr. Kaz Taylor. I'm looking forward to learning from her, and thank you so much for being here. many volunteers involved in our work um, and uh, over the last few years. And the people in red here are the people who are just hanging in in the lab and just finishing up. Anna Shabak has done a fantastic um, thesis that I'm not going to talk about looking at uh, behavioral fever and thermal preferences of monarch butterflies. And Erin um, Sheehy and, and Bernie are helping her out. We're wrapping up the monarch project in my lab, at least temporarily. It's, it's, um, we're at the end of, of it. So, migration. Migration is a spectacular phenomenon. 
it, it encompasses all kinds of taxa, all kinds of types of animals perform migration. We have the caribou, you know, marching across the plains. We have birds. I've studied bird migration and migratory species of birds in many things. And of course, we have monarch butterflies, which perform an incredible migration, especially for their size. But their migration um, starts in Mexico. You can start it anywhere, of course, it's a cycle. But uh, in, in Mexico, in the winter, they're in this little patch of uh, fir forest, um, where they, they, you've seen them in these roosts, is the, the, this gif image um, from previously is in, on the left, is them at, in their fir forest uh, roosts in the winter. And then they migrate north. There are actually two different populations, two migratory populations in North America, the eastern and the western. They're genetically identical to each other. We, we have not been able to distinguish any difference, genetic differences between them. So there must be more of what we call gene flow. There must be more exchanges between those populations than we really know about. There's still a lot of mysteries to, to learn about for, um, in monarchs. We've been studying the eastern migratory population, those are the, the ones that winter in Mexico. They fly north in the spring, the adults lay their eggs on milkweed plants, and, they, uh, and that generation then emerges and goes further north, and further north, and further north. And we get to about the fourth generation usually, after, after that, that first generation comes from Mexico, flies north, their offspring, fly north again, their offspring, and then again. So we get to the fourth generation, the great, great grandchildren of that first generation. And those, that generation then emerges as a migrant, as in this migratory uh, state. So they, um, they are not ready to reproduce. They're in this state that we call a reproductive diapause. They're, they have all, all their reproductive organs are sort of shriveled up, not, not really ready to, to actually produce eggs or, or um, to mate. And, um, and they, they look a little bit different. They have sort of slightly longer, pointier wings that are better adapted for long distance flights. And that migratory generation, they, they emerge in, say, Wisconsin, southern Canada, um, and they fly all the way to Mexico. They stop on the way to feed on nectar plants, but they don't stop and breed. They don't stop on, they don't, they're not really interested in milkweed except potentially as a, as a nectaring plant. Um, and they find their way back to the same little patch of fir forest in Mexico, in northern Mexico, that their great-great-grandparents were at. It's one of the great mysteries of the natural world. We do not know how they do that. I don't even actually know how we would find out how they do that. Right? It's, it's a really a deep, deep mystery. Yeah, they're coming back down in the fall. So they come back in, um, you know, they'd be coming back through here in sort of September, October, um, and heading back. So in the winter, that, that migratory generation, for the, the, uh, they, they get to Mexico, they hang out in Mexico, they feed a little bit, but mostly they're just sort of hanging out, and they live for nine months as an adult, which is a stunning amount of time for an adult butterfly to live. When they're in this reproductive state, they're living for four or five weeks at the most, you know, and, and once, they're, once they're breeding. But in this non-reproductive state, in this migratory state, they can, they can live for, for nine months and come back the next spring to be the first generation of the next of the next year, next year's crop. Migratory species, uh, sadly, are, are uh, subject to many, many threats. Um, urbanization affects migrants, uh, climate change, predation, and the way in which we're changing the predator, the predator landscape, um, habitat loss and degradation are all ways in which we uh, uh, have uh, migrants are threatened, well, not, just, not just butterflies, but also the easier to help, um, but also uh, birds and other migratory species. Disease and migration are really intimately linked. So you heard Elizabeth talk earlier a little bit about uh, about the, the disease that I'm going to talk about, Ophiocystis electroscura. But um, mi migration is thought in some in some cases at least, to be a way in which animals escape from disease. So if you live in one place all the time and you have a disease that can affect the environment, can infect the environment, then the disease population in that, in that 
if the disease in that population will build up and build up and build up. So migration, if you leave that place in the, in the spring and, or in the summer to go and breed somewhere else, uh, that's, that's a way of escaping that contaminated environment. And when you come back, by the time you come back in the, in the winter, um, it's, it's no longer contaminated, right? So, so migration, um, migratory escape is a, a way of, um, of escaping uh, disease. Migration is, is thought to have evolved in some cases as a way to escape disease. Um, migratory culling is the idea that the migrant individuals, if then um, if they're diseased, if they're sick in some way, they're not going to make it. They're going to die. They're going to get culled out of the population. So you're going to tend to have lower diseases, lower amounts of disease, lower lower infection levels in migratory population because of this effect, right? If you need to migrate long distance and you're not super fit, uh, you're, you're not going to make it. So if you're sick, uh, then, then the monarchs, and this happens in monarchs for sure. So migration and disease are, are really closely linked ecologically and, and evolutionarily. The disease I'm going to talk about are for your sister's Electroscura, also known as OE. I'm going to refer to it mostly as OE. It's a mouthful to say the full name. It's a, a, a disease that's more or less specific to monarchs. I think it can be found in queen butterflies, which are a closely, uh, closely related species, but otherwise it's, it's pretty much a monarch-specific disease. It's a protozoan, um, and it, uh, it can have uh, lethal effects on the monarchs. So sometimes the monarchs emerge if they're heavily infected, and they'll be all sort of crumpled up. You may have seen this if you've seen monarchs at all, and they'll be all like, um, they can't open their wings, and, and they're gonna die. There's no way if a monarch, if a fly can't fly, it's not, it's not gonna live. Um, and sometimes they, they die while they're still in the, uh, in the chrysalis. It can also have non-lethal effects. You can see butterflies that are infected with OE, and you can, you can tell that they're infected with OE, but they look fine. They seem fine. They can fly fine, and so it can and, and, and so it can be um, non-lethal, especially at lower doses. So the way that OE works, it relies on the monarch breeding. Right, non-breeding monarchs, migrating monarchs, don't spread OE. It relies on the milkweed and on the whole breed. So what happens is that uh, the spores develop in the adult butterfly on their abdomen, um, and when they fly over milkweed, those spores get dropped onto the milkweed leaves. When a female lays an egg on the milkweed, that egg, if she's infected, that egg will be coated with these spores. When the caterpillar emerges, first of all, from the egg, when it hatches from the egg, the first thing it does is eat that egg casing and then it starts eating the milkweed. Um, and that egg casing and the milkweed, if that egg and that milkweed is contaminated with, with OE spores, it will be infected. It will show no sign of infection as a caterpillar. It will grow normally and develop at the same rate, as far as we can tell. But when it emerges as an adult, it goes into the chrysalis phase and then comes out as an adult, that's when it starts to, that's when you can tell that whether or not it's infected. So it is possible for a, a male, when the male and females mate together, it is possible for the male to transfer a few spores to, to the female, um, but it's not really infection, right? The female is not actually infected, she doesn't have the, the protozoan inside her body, it's just a sort of picking up a few spores, but it can be one source of, of transmission, but it, we think that's kind of small. Um, monarchs need milkweed. Monarchs are specific, what we call, they have a host specificity to milkweed. And milkweed is not just one thing, right? There are something like a hundred species of milkweed or, or related plants that monarchs can use as as a host plant. And by host plant, I mean that's what the, the caterpillars can grow on. The caterpillars can only feed on various species of milkweed and related plants. They can't eat anything else. Um, and, and milkweeds have this toxin in them that's called the cardiac gly glycosides or cardenolides. Hey, this is um, and um, those toxins are, uh, are poisonous to most things, but monarchs have evolved a way to deal with them, to adapt to them. Monarchs can sequester these toxins. They can use them to sort of make themselves toxic. So when a bird eats a, a monarch caterpillar, it gets sick, so it doesn't do that. 
stops doing that pretty quickly once it figures out when the colours are a signal to the bird. Colours of the bat caterpillar are a signal to the bird, don't eat me, I'm poisonous, I'm toxic, I'm going to make you feel sick. Um, and, um, and so they have various physiological adaptations, monarchs do, to, to be able to deal with this, this particular form of toxin called cardenolite. It's found in most milkweed species. We did an investigation, when I say we, I mean the university, Lewis did an, an investigation where he uh, wanted to see what were all of the host plants of monarch butterflies, or for monarch caterpillars really, what can they eat? And of course, host specificity is multiple things, right? There's multiple things that have to happen in order for that to, that to, that plant to be used by the, by, or eaten by the uh, caterpillar. The first thing is the female has to choose that plant for that preference. The female has to lay an egg on that plant. And in order to do that, she has to recognize it as something that, that is a milkweed, is the, is the right kind of species. And so there are various chemical cues that the, the female uses, smells basically, that she uses to, to identify which plants are milkweed and therefore hosts for her, her offspring. The next thing that has to happen is once that caterpillar emerges from the egg, um, it has to eat the milkweed. It has to be able to eat the plant that it's on. And that sounds like it should be easy, but plants have a lot of defenses to stop things eating them. Um, they can make their leaves, they can have leaves, you can have plants where the leaves are really tough. Many plants have these little hairs on them that we call trichomes, and that can make it quite difficult for a caterpillar, especially a very small caterpillar, to eat. Milkweeds, especially the milkweeds we know, often have latex in them. That's what the milk is in the milkweed. It's actually a kind of latex. And the really tiny monarch caterpillars, which are you know, really, really small and white, they can sometimes, if they, if they eat the, the milkweed in the wrong way, they can actually sort of get caught in the latex and even drown in the latex. The latex is thick and sticky and it's a, it's a way to prevent um, animals eating them. And of course then, then also uh, plants can be toxic. So the, the, uh, the caterpillar has to be physically able to eat the milkweed. That's that power's ability. It also has to recognize it as food. If I gave you a piece of uh, food, if I gave you a pizza that looked like a piece of cardboard, you wouldn't eat it because you don't recognize it as food, right? It doesn't smell like food, it doesn't look like food. In this case, it's not so much looks, it's more, more smell, more um, uh, the chemical cues. So it has to, has to be palatable, has to, has to seem like it's food for the, for the caterpillar. And then if the caterpillar does eat it, can and does eat it, then it has to survive on that plant, right? If the caterpillar eats it and then they all die because the plant is toxic to it or because it doesn't provide the right set of nutrients, then the, um, it's not gonna be, it's not, it's not really a good host plant. So that first step, the preference, the adult preference, the female preference, has been studied quite a lot. So we decided, Lewis decided to study these next two steps, the palatability and the survival of uh, caterpillars on the various different um, milkweeds. And we couldn't do all that work ourselves, so what he did was do a, a, what we call a literature review. He read every paper we could find about monarchs on every different plant we, we could find uh, on, it, on all different plants and, and compiled all that information together into his own publication. Um, we reviewed, there were 127 species of plants that we found that have either been tested or claimed to be host plants. Um, and if, if those plants were, uh, if the evidence in the literature was that the monarchs could eat, the caterpillars could eat them and that they could survive in high numbers, we called those high performance plants. Um, and about 34 of the plants were high performance hosts. Um, and another 42 were low performance. That meant that the monarchs would eat them, or some of the monarchs would eat them, um, and some of the monarchs would survive. And it could be low performance either because they would, not all of them would eat it, or because not all of them would survive. And in either case, we, we didn't really distinguish between those two reasons. 33 of them were completely non-hosts for whatever reason. They, could, they never, they couldn't, couldn't survive. And then there's still 18 plants plant species that have never been tested, that are claimed in some, in some website somewhere based on the list that Lewis compiled um, to be hosts for monarch caterpillars, but we don't really know that that's true. Um, one of the things when we, we did a comparison, we also went through the literature and looked for 
measures of pargamaline kind of concentration and that kind of toxins. And we found that the high performance hosts have higher pargamaline concentrations than the low performance hosts. So the, mono, the, the, better, the better host plants are actually higher on average in cardenolides uh, than, than the low performance hosts. We think this is probably because the, the, um, the, low, the plants with low cardenolides probably have high levels of other kinds of toxins and the plant and the monarchs can't tolerate other kinds of toxins but they can tolerate cardenolides. So they, they not exactly they prefer cardenolides but they prefer the plants with cardenolides because the plants with high cardenolides don't have high other toxins, secondary toxins. The, the, the species you've all been talking about, tropical milkweed, Asclepias curosapica, is a high performance host. Monarchs love this plant. Um, it is not native to this region, it's native to South, South America, South and Central America. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful plant um, and monarchs, all of the experiments we've done on it say that they grow fast, they come out big, they're thick, they're deep red. Monarchs love this plant, monarchs do really well on this plant, the females will choose it, it's a high performance house all the way through. So I don't want you to leave this talk thinking that, you know, Asclepias corosarica tropical milkweed is bad. It's not. It's a good host. We monitored, um, so I live in New Orleans. We work in New Orleans. We're working in urban situations. We, we did a monitoring um, project where we started in 2017, October of 2017, and went until COVID hit and we actually made, made, managed to heroically keep it going until not me, but my students managed to heroically keep this, mon this monitoring project going until May of 2020, even though all of the undergraduates went home in March of 2020. So that last two months was really tough. And then we gave up at that point. We were, we were hoping to go until for at least a full three years, but we didn't quite make it. So we found uh, yards in, in, uh, in New Orleans, in the uptown area, which is where Tulane University is. And we that had milkweed in them, and we monitored how many uh, oh, yeah. and we monitored the um, we, we monitored the, the, the we looked up on those plants for eggs and larvae and recorded how many eggs, how many different the, the larvae go through these five different stages, we call them instars, so the, the little tiny ones are first instar and then the next ones are second, third, fourth and fifth instar and then they turn into chrysalises. So we monitored all the how many of the, every different stage from egg to, to fifth instar and, and uh, uh, chrysalises when we could find them on, on 40 different sites. Um, <coughs> In finding the sites, we found about three percent of the yards in uptown in uptown New Orleans had about had milkweed in it. Ninety-five percent of those were only tropical milkweed. There was a very small number that had any non any native milkweed. This is a non-native plant. Um, we found this milkweed, this tropical milkweed, to be in blue every single month that we checked it, except for February 2018. February 2018. Remember that far back, but in January 2018, there was a whole series of really pretty hard freezes, and and all the milkweed and the monarchs were all gone for, for a while. But so February 2018 was the only, not only the only month we didn't find milkweed, we didn't find milkweed in bloom or tropical milkweed in bloom. It's a pretty amazing plant that it's, it's here year round and it blooms year round in our region. Um, within two weeks of that freeze event in 2018 some of the milkweed plants were, were starting to bud again, starting to produce flowers again. Um, so what has happened in the Gulf Coast region, I don't know if you can see the screen very well, um, what's happened in the Gulf Coast region is that uh, the monarchs are going north, and, uh, as I described before, but then we think either when they come south or perhaps when they go north, but, but, but most likely when they come south in the fall, they, they're in this reproductive diaphragm, this migratory state. They encounter milkweed that's still blooming, that's still green, and it's not senescing the way that the, the native milkweeds in this region do. And it causes them to drop out of diaphragms and they start breeding. They start mating and then they start laying eggs on, this, on the tropical milkweed. 
And then when their offspring <coughs> emerge, they don't have the um, the right cues, the right proto period, the right day length cues to be migrants. So they emerge as non migrants. And then we have this winter breeding, in fact, this year round breeding population of monarchs all the way along the Gulf Coast in New Orleans and, and presumably on the border too, I think. So, so along the so we've got this winter breeding population along the Gulf Coast that is formed, um, and it's formed, we think, because of tropical milkweed, because tropical milkweed is here and blooming and green in the winter, whereas the native milkweeds will sort of naturally senesce in the winter, and you won't have uh, the, the anything for them to to lay their eggs on. Um, and so we wanted to look at this, how OE, what the patterns of OE are across the, the this winter breeding range of monarch butterflies. And this was work that was led by Kristen Steele and uh, was done in collaboration with Sonia Altizer and Paola Barriga, the University of Georgia. So we used data from this uh, uh, pretty incredible citizen science uh, project called Project Monarch Health. Um, I don't know if any of you participated in Project Monarch Health. Okay. So uh, what you do if you have Project Monarch Health, you catch an adult butterfly and um, <coughs> you put a little piece of tape on its abdomen, a little piece of clear tape, like, like uh, what do you call it, uh, scotch tape, and then you pull it off and you put that piece of tape onto a, a, a card, a white card, and you mail it to, um, to the University of Georgia uh, and they look at it underneath the microscope and they can see, um, in, underneath the microscope, they can see whether or not it has these little tiny spores of OE on it. And they record the, the level of infection, whether or not that, that butterfly was infected. And then you let the butterfly go. You don't want to so it's, not, it's a non-destructive uh, citizen science. And so they've been doing this for a while all over the place, all over the North America, trying to track the levels of OE through, through this citizen science, through having volunteers, people like you guys, um, do this. Sometimes people bring them behind the larvae and bring them into their, their homes and wait for them to, uh, they bring the caterpillars into their homes, wait for them to close, and then and they have the, the butterflies to, to test, do this tape test, we call it. Um, other times they catch them with a net and, and put them, uh, do the tape test on them. I wanted to take a little detour and just say thank you if you have participated in Project One Health or any other citizen science program. Most of the work that I do in my lab is actually on birds and migratory birds and I would be completely lost. I wouldn't have a career without some of the citizen science databases. Things like eBird and the Breeding Bird Survey and the Christmas Bird Counts. Um, so, uh, and then Project Monarch Health and many, many other, the iNaturalist accounts which all get fed into this global uh, biodiversity, uh, uh, what's it called, DBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Framework or something. So all of these observations that you make with, with those, now we have all these great apps to do this, um, are really, really useful. So if you're participating in citizen science of any kind, thank you, and please keep it up. So what we what we saw with the project on health, um, we did we we uh, got 16,934 different data points. This is only from the, what we call the southeast region of the United States, um, across 22 states, 268 cities, and 329 individual volunteers. Um, we divided up our, our regions based on this uh, this uh, plant hardiness zone. So you probably know your gardeners here. So you probably know what hardiness zones are. This is a measure of how how cold it gets really in the winter. So um, we are in. Um, I guess you're in ten. Uh, is it nine or ten? Nine. Yes. Yeah. So we're in nine. We're the same in New Orleans as, we, as you are over here in North Florida, um, and uh, down in South Florida. It's uh, 10, it's in the zone 10, out right on the, on the Keys in Florida, <coughs> it's uh, actually zone 11. So what we found when we looked at the patterns of OE prevalence, prevalence means the percentage of individuals that were infected. So 
um, up in the north area, the upper central and the mid central, we got four and a half or 12 percent um, prevalence overall. Down in South Florida, we have 86, 83.6, 83 percent of the butterflies that we caught, or that, that you all caught, that the citizen science got, citizen science got, were, were infected with those. Over here in North Florida, where we are right now, I'm not actually sure if you were counted in the Western Gulf Coast or if you're actually in North Florida. I went and looked at the map, but I couldn't, it, it's, not, it's not quite enough resolution. I'd have to go back and actually look at the data. But in, the, in North Florida, there was a 71.5% and in the Western Gulf Coast region, which is the same hardiness zone, there was a slightly lower 63.9% infection. Really high prevalence. We found from the monitoring data that in the summertime, by, by about June, July, by about July, if you go and catch a monarch butterfly, an adult monarch butterfly in New Orleans, it's going to be infected. 100% of them are infected in, in New Orleans at this, by the time you get into the sort of mid-summer time. So there's this latitudinal pre um, pattern of, of, of uh, prevalence, of OE prevalence. Down in the south, we've got really high prevalence, and in this winter breeding region, really high prevalence. And when you get further north, where there is not, not so much room or no winter breeding, then the prevalence of OE drops off. We also investigated um, the, the, the temporal, spatial temporal patterns of the temp time patterns. So we're looking, if you look across these patterns, it shows that the color of it shows the prevalence of OE from zero to one. Um, and the, across the, the horizontal axis, it's going to, across the year from January to December. As you go uh, on the vertical axis, it's going from 2011 to 2019, so we're looking across years. So what you notice in South Florida is there's pretty much, it's just high all the time. There's really almost no drop off uh, in, uh, across the year. There's not very much variation between years. There's not seem to be any real seasonal patterns in particular. In North Florida, we've got a little bit of a seasonal pattern. It's kind of a little bit of a, of a rise in the middle of the year and a little bit of a drop out. But it's not that big. It's sort of a, it's sort of a shallow um, pattern. In the Western Gulf region, we have these, these cycles, right? We have this big, big drop and then it drops down and uh, goes up in the summer, drops down in the fall, goes back up again in the winter. So we have these two cycles. We have these very strong seasonal patterns. Um, and up in the mid-central and upper mid-central and upper central regions, the prevalence was kind of low. We don't really have any data for, for non-summer and for the uh, upper central because there is no winter breeding, so there are no adult products around to, to, uh, to test. Um, and the mid-central was, was not very much in the way of, uh, of seasonal dynamics either because there just aren't very many monarchs in the, in the winter. Um, so this, this meshed with, with what we found in the um, in the um, monitoring in New Orleans, we see this rise in the spring up to 100%. Every monarch court is, is, is in New Orleans and then drops in the fall, comes back up, and then goes down. So, why do you think that is? Any ideas? What's your hypothesis here? More, there's just more monarchs, which is true. There are, there are in some cases more monarchs, although right in the middle of summer we see, seem to see a sort of drop off in New Orleans at least. But yeah. Yeah, they might be. But what we think, what I think is happening here, is um, the the it rises during the. The spring, right? The monarchs come in in the spring. This is following. This is in 2018, right? This is following that freeze. We had no, there's no prevalence because there's no monarchs in February, and then we start to see the adults, and those adults, and this is in New Orleans. Those adults are coming back from the winter, from the wintering region, from Mexico. They're coming up and they're starting to breed in our region. They're breeding on top of the milkweed in this in this data set. This is the monitoring data set, and as they breed, the, the milkweed. The, um, the OE builds up 
on the milkweed itself and in the caterpillars and it just spreads and it builds up and builds up until in the middle of summer every single caterpillar, every single adult, every single butterfly is infected. And then what happens in this late summer, this drop, is that the fall migrants, right, the, they come back down south and so I think this is just, this is a dilution effect, is what we call it, in, in, um, where the monarchs that are coming south are generally not infected. And so every monarch you catch, on average, you're gonna have some that aren't infected anymore. If the, the local ones are all infected, but the ones that are coming south, which are mixed in, are not infected. So we see these drops due to the influx of migrants coming, coming, coming south. So, we see these seasonal patterns in, we see these seasonal patterns in North Florida, but we don't see these seasonal patterns. Sorry, I said it the wrong way. We see these seasonal patterns, these ups and downs, these oscillations in the Gulf Coast region, the Western Gulf Coast region. But over in North Florida, and like I say, I, I know we're in North Florida here, but uh, only just. I think we're already in the Western Gulf, or we're, we're on the edge there, so I'm not really sure which of these patterns applies here. Um, but we, we don't see these seasonal patterns in North Florida. And what I think is happening, what we think is happening, is that in North Florida, as soon as uh, there's a freeze, they are in the same hardiness zone, so the frequency of freezes in the winter is the same in, in North Florida as it is in New Orleans and the Western Gulf Coast region. But what happens is after a freeze in North Florida, all the monarchs might, might get killed off, monarchs have a very pretty, uh, they don't, they can't tolerate very cold weather, so they, they get killed off, but then they'll get recolonized, the population will re, 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 get recolonized from South Florida, and that South Florida population is so infected with OE that, that it just maintains these high levels of infection, so you see these little bits of these seasonal patterns, but not very much in North Florida. Whereas in the Western Gulf Coast region, certainly over as far over as New Orleans, when they get wiped out, when the monarchs get wiped out after a freeze, when they come back, they're coming back from Mexico. And so it takes, they have to wait. So in February, in February 2018, we didn't see any monarchs, for, adult monarchs, for, or any kind of monarchs actually, for... <laughs> It was, um, I think, March or April, I think it was April before we started seeing adults uh, again after that freeze. So they, those are the migrants coming back from Mexico. And those migrants are only infected at a very low level. So we start off with this low infection following a freeze, and then it builds up in this, in this essentially resident population uh, in the Western Gulf Coast region. We also tested to see whether the OE prevalence was, was linked to um, temperature, to urbanization, and we found that it was, that we have um, both things going on. So at high temperatures, you have higher OE levels. Um, and that um, from, this is also from the Project Monarch Health data, and higher urbanization, the urban areas have higher prevalence of OE than, than the rural areas. Um, It's really hard to test the plants. We can test the plants, um, but you have to really know what you're looking for. So if you, you get a, a leaf of a milkweed plant and you're looking for spores, there's a lot of things that can look like spores. There's a lot of pollen, there's a lot of dust, there's a lot of things in the air that you have to be really an expert to, to test. So we don't have like a genetic, or maybe we do have a genetic test, but it's not, it's not you know, easy or cheap, uh, cheaply available. So we don't test the, the plants generally. We test them sometimes when we have plants in the lab to make to look, look for spores. But that visual way of assessment it works on monarch, you know, on monarchs because there's nothing else on a monarch. If, if you've got those little dots on it, the, you can see, you can tell they're spores. There's nothing else that could be really. But on the leaf, there's just so many, so many things. If you ever look, take a piece of a leaf and look at it under a microscope like that, it's, it's really hard to tell. And it can be kind of patchy, right? The spores can be over here and over here, but not over here. And so you, you can only look at a little piece of a leaf at a time in a microscope. And so it's, there's not a really efficient way of doing it.
Yeah, they can, the, the spores can survive anywhere, right? The spores are really hardy. You can put them in a the freezer and they'll, they'll, and they'll live forever, basically. basically. Um, and with their spores, you know, they, 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 they will survive just about anywhere. But in order to infect the cattle, in order to infect, infect the monarch, they have to be consumed. And the, milk, the monarch will only eat milk food, right? So uh, uh, an adult flying around on other plants, nectaring on other plants, might deposit spores, but those spores are never going to make their way into a monarch caterpillar. And so they're never going to really be infect anybody else. So it's sort of a dead end. So the OE actually relies, it's a really good point, because the OE relies on the monarch being in this breeding state, right? OE can't really spread um, in, if, it's not, if it's not breeding, right? If the, if the monarch. So we looked at, um, uh, so we found that there's this temperature effect, and we looked at some data. This is data from New Orleans showing the minimum temperature reached every year since uh, 18 something, 1880 something. Um, and uh, you can see that long ago, it used to be that we would get a temperature below zero every single year. This is the minimum temperature that, that we see every year. And so it was always, that there was almost always, there was one year uh, back in, I think, 1907 or something, where it only reached zero, zero degrees Celsius, that's freezing, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So below zero means it's freezing, it was a freeze. So there was a freeze every single year until 1998, where there was no freeze. And then there was a freeze every year up until 2007. Uh, but then since then, we've had multiple years. This only goes up to 2020, but, uh, and this is from New Orleans. 2012, 2013, 2016, all the years without freezing. This is climate change, right? It's getting warmer, the environment's getting warmer. One of the things that can mean in certain areas, uh, it, it can mean a lot of different things, right? Climate change can mean a lot of different things depending on where you are. But in our area, what it means is that we're less likely to get those freezes. That means we're less likely every year to wipe out the population of monarchs and of milkweed that is that is breeding and, and that means that the the OE levels if the monarchs really are breeding year round and every year and keep breeding without without any uh, resetting that is caused by the freezes then the OE levels just go up and stay up stay really high so we built a little model a little simulation model on the computer it's called an agent based model or an individual based model and And I don't know if you can see it, but the little orange things moving around are monarch butterflies. We made them go uh, go blue when they got infected. The little green patches are the milkweed patches. So we, we made this model match the conditions in uptown New Orleans. So 3% of the, of the patches are they're meant to represent yards in, New, in uptown New Orleans. Some of them have milkweed in them. And the monarchs fly around when they encounter milkweed, they lay eggs on it. Um, when, and, and sometimes deposit spores on it. The caterpillars emerge in this model and they and then they fly around. And then we can put temperature into this model and see what happens under different temperature regimes because all of these processes that monarchs experience are temperature dependent. We ran the model for two different years and we mimicked the years of 2017 and 2018. And really, I'm just going to show you the data for the second year, the, the mimic 2018. But we modified the climate. We had one model that was the actual climate. And remember, there was that freeze in 2018, so that was this freeze. And we had another model where we took away the freeze and just ran the model as if that, that freeze hadn't happened. Um, and we also uh, had this influx in the model of these migrants in the spring and, uh, and leaving and coming coming, coming in uh, in the spring and coming in in the fall. So we put, we put that into the into the model. Uh, this is the sort of flowchart of how the model works. So we have uninfected monarchs laying uninfected eggs um, that become uninfected larvae or caterpillars, uh, etc. And then we have infected monarchs that lay infected eggs. And, and so on, and then we have a contamination in the environment, so so uh, uninfected monarchs can become infected. What we found when we ran this model, we simulated this model. We found it. We, we ran it under four different um, uh, scenarios, different temperature scenarios. So in the first scenario, there's a constant. I, we set the constant the temperature to be this constant ideal temperature for monarch growth, um, and 
The second one, we, we mimicked the, the conditions of 2018, but without the freeze. We took away the freeze, we pushed up the, the temperature data. Uh, in the third one, we, we, we ran it with a freeze, but we assumed that the freeze only affected the monarchs and not the milkweed, so the, the milkweed didn't get knocked out. So the environment is still contaminated when the migrants come back in the spring in that scenario that the, that the, um, the, the monarchs are gone. And then we removed the milkweeds, uh, and then in the fourth scenario, we, we had a really deep freeze that removed both the milkweed and the monarchs. Um, so there's no milkweed, and then we have the milkweed being replanted or growing back, but uncontaminated. So you can see that the, under the constant ideal temperature or the no freeze, the dynamics of OE, the, the prevalence of OE, is pretty much the same. So if you don't have a freeze in New Orleans, which is the same as if you have perfect for monarchs temperature all year round, or for OE, really, perfect weather for OE all year round. So you get this uh, drop off when the, monarch, the, uh, the migrants come in, in the, in the when those dotted lines are when, when we simulated the income influx of migrants. So you get this drop off, build back up of OE, drop off again in the fall, build back up of OE in the winter. When we have the, uh, the deep freezes, we have this complete drop of OE, or the monarchs are gone in, under that scenario, so there's no OE in, the, in there, and then it builds back up. In the case where the milkweed was removed, it builds up kind of slowly. It takes a while until the four migrants come in, and then it sort of shoots up. In, when, when we simulated the milkweed not being removed, it builds up much more quickly than that. So we think this, this period in sort of May and June is really the critical period. If we have really high levels of OE in our resident populations here, um, that's when the migrants will come through. And if we built up a lot of OE in the environment, that might be infecting the migrants. We don't really know whether the caterpillars that we here, uh, or that, that are produced here, continue further north or not all the time. But if they do, they're likely to be infected and they're likely to spread this into the migratory population, which is a, a big concern. So we think that there is essentially an interaction between this planting, this, this uh, supplementation, is what ecologists call it, this, this tropical milkweed that we are providing. It's an urbanized, it's, you know, it's OE is higher in urbanized areas because that's where tropical milkweed is in, this, in the Gulf region. Um, and climate change is an interaction between those two things is creating an environment in which there's a huge level of OE, a huge prevalence of OE. Um, the high levels of OE infection are, are pretty much unavoidable if we keep planting OE. It's just, it, there's no way to, if we're gonna have winter breeding, we're gonna have high levels of OE. We can't really, uh, we can't do much about uh, what's happening with the climate. We can, for the long term we can, but we can't do very much in the short term about what's, what's happening with the climate. We're not gonna get lots of freezes to, to knock this back. Um, but we still don't really know how this population, this, this high level of OE, is really impacting the migrants. But it's a little bit scary. We don't really want to encourage these really high levels of, of OE in the population. So what to do about it? This is where I need to need the gardeners to help me because I am not a gardener. Um, plant natives, if you plant native milkweeds, those native milkweeds will die back naturally in the fall and we won't get monarchs drop, dropping out and we won't have these winter breeding populations. Um, I used to think the winter breeding populations were great. You know, these Sebius Karasavica is great. I like having monarchs around. But I think that by having these winter breeding populations, we're, we're really breeding our weed. We're really producing these really heavily infected and sick uh, populations. So, yeah, milkweed. These are the three species that I've tried to plant in my yard in New Orleans. I haven't done very well with any of them. It's Curisavica. Curisavica um, does way better than Curisavica is the tropical milkweed. Is, is the only species I've ever really managed to grow successfully. Um, Incarnata and Perennis. Perennis is very small and the monarchs don't seem to like it very much, at least in my region. And um, Incarnata will grow well for a season, but then it will never come back. It's supposed to be a perennial plant, but it never comes back the next year, at least. And I'm not a very good gardener, but yeah. What's your... She said um, they like to be wet. They're swamp, the first two are swamp plants, so 
If you want to try and grow them, I encourage you to do so. They will die back naturally. Incarnata is a really good plant. My, my colleagues at UGA, Sonia Altizer and, and uh, people, they use Incarnata for their experiments when they're exper doing experiments with Monix. I use Curasavica, a tropical milkweed, because it's the only thing I can get to grow properly in, the, in even in a greenhouse situation. And I want to do experiments in the, during the, the semester time, and the Incarnata will, will senesce and die back. So tropical milkweed is really great for doing experiments. Uh, the other thing you can, the other thing you can do if you're planting Curasavica and planting tropical milkweed is just cut it back in the fall, mimic those processes. So you can grow fine during the summer. You let the monarchs breed on it, the OE levels will build up, but if you cut it back in the fall, you won't get the, the winter breeding population. Um, you probably have to cut it back pretty, people always ask me like how, how soon or what time of year I should really cut it back, and I don't really know, but I think it's probably pretty early. Um, I don't know when, when do you think the monarchs come back through here? Until April, basically, until then. Once you see, um, in the winter, yeah, you cut it back during January and February, and then, uh, and then it, it, it will grow back. It doesn't grow, it, depending on how warm it is during the winter, it won't grow back that fast. It, you won't have to cut it back multiple times, I think. You cut it back uh, a few times. Maybe over here you have a warmer climate. In New Orleans, and I think that's basically what I have for you, right? So my, migrants are important, migration is important, and um, I had a quote, I just have that quote. Yeah, okay, I still have the quote here. Um, I was uh, wanted to leave you with the words of uh, David Wilcox, uh, who wrote this book called No Way Home, The Decline of the World's Great Animal Migrations. And he said that if we are successful at saving the world's great animal migrations, we will have protected natural phenomena that provide us with inspiration, sustenance, recreation, and numerous ecosystem benefits. We will also have learned, and this is important, to have stopped, taken timely cooperative action to address an environmental problem. It is impossible, it is even possible that our efforts to protect migratory animals will inform our efforts to address other environmental problems that transcend boundaries, uh, state and, and uh, national boundaries. At the very least, we will have ensured that the same uh, future generations can enjoy some of the same flocks of birds, schools of fish, herds of mammals and flocks of butterflies that have inspired us and sustained us for thousands of years. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, she's asking what the percentage of OE in Mexico is about 10%. In the wintering population, it's about 10%. It's definitely true in New Orleans too, but if you go to a plant nursery, the only species of milkweed that you can find typically is, is a person. Is well, that's the other thing you can do is, you know, when you go to a plant nursery, ask for the natives, you know, and they won't have them, but if you keep asking for them, if you all keep asking for them, eventually they will happen. They know if they know there's a market for them, they will get them. Yeah. Yeah, if they're growing the curse avocado in in a greenhouse, you know, then it may not be effective. But if it has eggs on it already, it's probably it's often going to be effective. So um, yeah, if it, yeah, I know I noticed that too, yeah. Thank you everybody.